You're stranded, deep behind enemy lines and surrounded by an army that hates you. Your allies have already surrendered or are dead. Your only choices are to fight and win or die. The Persian Empire was founded in 550 BC and at its height covered 2.1 million square miles from the Balkans and Egypt in the west to the Indus Valley in the east. The conflict between the empire and Greece first began when Darius the Great invaded Greece in 492 BC. His forces were defeated just two years later at the Battle of Marathon, thus ending Darius's Greek ambitions. While Darius's forces were defeated, hostilities between the empire and Greece would continue through Darius's son, a son many of you may know as this guy. Yes, this guy. You know, the one from that movie who liked to hang out with weird goat men? Xerxes' invasion of Greece began in 480 BC, and also included the famous battle depicted in the movie 300 that most people are familiar with. But the Greeks proved to be too much for the King of Kings, and his campaign ended in 479, just about a year after it began. So basically, the Greeks handed the most powerful empire on Earth two crushing defeats in just 11 years. Which leads us to the villain of our story, a guy named Artaxerxes II. Now keep in mind, we're talking about a guy whose name roughly translates to better than Xerxes, so you know he had a lot to live up to. And there was someone who definitely didn't think Arta measured up. His younger brother, cleverly named Cyrus the Younger. Get it? Because he was the younger brother. You get it. You see, Cyrus wanted the throne for himself. And this brotherly grudge match is where our story truly begins. And Cyrus had one really big advantage over his brother. He controlled a large area in the far west of the empire that included a border on the Mediterranean Sea. In the port city of Ephesus, Cyrus raised his army. This included his own retainers, but more importantly, mercenaries. And not just any mercenaries, but the most feared heavy infantry in the ancient world. 10,000 Greek hoplites, heavily armed and armored. The very same troops that had defeated the empire, not once, but twice, were now marching to war under Cyrus's banner. Southeast they marched, into the heart of Artaxerxes' territory. All told, they marched over a thousand miles in full gear, finally arriving at the stronghold of Kunaxa, just north of Babylon. The 10,000 mercenaries formed ranks spears out, ready to water the sand with Persian blood. The Persian army formed up as well, rank upon rank, outnumbering the Greeks four to one, and proceeded to quickly run away. As they watched the retreating army, the Greeks were left confused and frustrated. Hadn't they just marched a thousand miles to win a throne for Cyrus? If they didn't defeat the Persians here and now, how long before they could go home? How long before they could get paid? Were they just going to let them run away? No, they thought, and began pursuit. Seeing that the Greeks had chased the bulk of the army from the field of battle, Cyrus decided it would be a good time for his own advance, deep into Persian lines in an attempt to find and kill Artaxerxes. But his plan was foiled when he was stabbed in the face with a spear and promptly died. The 10,000 returned from having routed the bulk of the Persian army, only to find their prince dead, their allies surrendered, and their supplies on fire. Maybe, just maybe, pursuing the fleeing army had not been such a good idea after all. The Greeks found themselves surrounded by an army that now greatly outnumbered them. With no possibility of getting paid, their thoughts turned to survival and a chance to return home. But their hopes are low, as the Persians' hatred for Greeks isn't exactly a secret.
but their hopes are rekindled when a Persian messenger bearing the white flag of truce invites the Greek commanders to negotiate the terms of their surrender and return to Greece. Hey, Giorgio. Yeah? You think the negotiations are going well? I mean, they've been in there for hours now. Wait, wait, I see something. Are those goats? Looks like goats. Yeah, it wasn't goats. Giorgio? Yeah? I think we're boned. Yeah. It was then that one man rose to rally the troops. Xenophon. Whoever desires to see his friends again, let him show himself a brave man, for in no other way can he accomplish this. And whoever desires to save his life, let him strive for victory, for it is the victors that slay, and the defeated that are slain. Whoever longs for wealth, let him strive to conquer, for conquerors keep their own possessions and those of the conquered. With the Xenophon in command, the 10,000 surged north toward the Persian lines, using the mighty Tigris River as a bulwark against being flanked. The sudden ferocity of the charge overwhelmed the Persians, and the Greeks broke through. The 10,000 escaped north, following the path of the Tigris River. But the Persians wouldn't give up so easily, and they pursued the Greeks, using their cavalry to harry the 10,000 with nightly raids. The Greeks arrived at the Great Zab River, which presented Xenophon with a serious problem. The Persians were following hot on their heels, and the 10,000 would be vulnerable to attack while they were trying to cross. The Greeks put the river at their backs and turned to face their pursuers. Confronted by the Greek phalanx, the Persians halted and a standoff ensued. Rather than face the Greeks directly, the Persians made camp and waited for reinforcements. With the Persians settled into camp and seemingly unwilling to engage, the 10,000 used the opportunity to escape across the Great Zab River under cover of darkness. The 10,000 continued north into the mountainous regions of modern-day Kurdistan. Along these mountainous paths, they would face a new enemy, the hill tribes of Cardusians. The Cardusians, a notoriously tough and quarrelsome people, attacked the outsiders using hit and run ambush tactics. More men were lost in those mountain passes than had been killed by Persians. With the mountain passes behind them, the Greeks had only one major river to cross before being able to make a straight shot to Greek territory along the Black Sea. There was just one problem. The Persians had gotten there ahead of them, they had already deployed along the far side of the river. Persian forces were arrayed to block the largest and closest crossing on the Botan River. With the primary ford across the river blocked, Xenophon had a decision to make. His scouts had found another ford nearby that wasn't quite as large or safe, but it might be the only chance. The Greeks made a quick break for the secondary ford. Seeing that his quarry was trying to escape, the Persian commander split his forces in two and sent half to cover the other ford. Which is exactly what Xenophon had hoped for. The Greeks had already doubled back and were now able to attack a Persian force that was at half strength. The 10,000 surged across the river flurry of bronze armor and Greek muscle, they annihilated the Persians.
With the Persians now in their rear view, the Greeks faced a far more terrifying enemy, an implacable foe that would claim more men than the Persians and Cardusians combined. Winter. Food was scarce, and the hoplite uniform isn't exactly warm. Many men died of exposure and starvation. After more than seven months on the road, the 10,000 finally reached Greek territory in the form of the port city of Trapezus. The scent of the salt air and the sight of Greek ships filled the men with relief and gratitude. They had survived and were finally going home. If you enjoyed this content, please like, subscribe, and comment below. I promise to respond to you as soon as I can.